the uh, Ali uh, Gallipur. Um, so he will be talking about exclusive independent probability estimations. Um, so yeah. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, this is Ryan Hashimi's work and I'm presenting because uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to attend the conference. Um, so the subject is uh, iso-intense infant brain MRI segmentation. This is the outline. Um, uh, first, I give an introduction and talk about the significance of the problem. Then we will talk about the approach that we've developed, and that includes a uh, few components uh, that include independent, automatically adjusted F-beta loss functions um, per class that we want to segment. Um, we use a deep 3D FC dense net architecture with dense blocks and skip connections, and large overlapping 3D patches with a patch pre uh, prediction fusion strategy. Then I will talk about the, uh, the results and the impact and applications of, of the approach. Um, if you look at MRI, you, we can dis distinguish three phases of brain development. Um, in fact, uh, a newborn brain uh, is appeared as, uh, on a T1-weighted image, is appeared as uh, dark uh, white matter and um, brighter gray matter, whereas in an adult-like brain, the contrast is reversed. Same happens on the T2-weighted images. So because of uh, that developmental uh, aspect of, um, of the brain uh, growth, at some point, which is uh, roughly between six to eight months, uh, these, uh, the co tissue contrasts become similar. And so we call this the iso-intense uh, phase in which it's um, much more difficult to um, segment the gray matter and white matter. Um, this image is taken from the iso-intense infant brain MRI segmentation challenge, or the ISEC, um, and, and the website is also uh, linked here. So if you look at the histograms, you see a lot of uh, the histograms at infant, infantile phase or the iso-intense phase. For both the T1-weighted and T2-weighted MRI, you see a lot of overlap between the intensity values of the gray matter and white matter. Basically, they are very difficult to distinguish from each other based on MRI scans. Um, and I just show one or two slides about why we're interested in looking at early brain development. This um, plot shows um, processes that are going on during brain development, and you see that this is scaled, um, um, not scaled appropriately, because a lot of processes are going on early on. That includes myelination, synaptogenesis, and apoptosis. The peak of all of these events happen in the first year of life of, or before to, uh, the um, child goes to the second year of age. Um, and for that reason, accurate segmentation of um, these images, um, especially to the tissue, is of utmost importance to, in studying both normal and abnormal brain development. And as I said, um, you see lowest tissue contrast around six to eight months of age, uh, which makes it very difficult. In, on top of that, um, there is, we always um, have the problem of data imbalance in medical image segmentation. Um, in almost always, and um, especially when the tissues show close intensity values, that might be problematic. Now that brings me to the approach, and I start with the beta asymmetric similarity loss functions. In 2016, for the famous VNet architecture, which is a 3D unit, uh, the dice loss function was proposed to take care of the data imbalance uh, issue. Um, DICE is a harmonic mean of precision re and recall. It weights the false positives and false negatives equally. Uh, it's actually the same as F1. So you see that DICE is a special case of the F-beta scores. So then, in applications that we were dealing with, including the iso-intense infant brain MRI segmentation, we thought to use a more generalized version which is the F-beta score directly in order to 
um, help the networks uh, deal with the imbalanced data better. Um, so as compared to the DICE similarity metric and its properties, including its generalization, such as generalized DICE, which has been designed originally for multi-class segmentation using uh, the F1 score, the F beta loss function explicitly controls the trade-off between precision and recall. That means it gives you a cap capability to um, weigh the false positives and false ne negatives uh, differently in the training phase. Uh, it doesn't need anything to calculate separate weights for the classes, um, and so it has good properties that help us to train networks better. Uh, now, a little bit about single label versus multi-label. The common procedure is to deal with all the labels in image segmentation in a multi-class environment. In that scenario, each voxel can only have one label. We use the softmax in the last layer in order to compare classes, and the output will be the class that we choose. This could lead to complications due to hum human error on the border of voxels, especially in the ISO intense areas that might be problematic. We might have noisy labels, we might have indistinguishable uh, intensity values. Uh, as opposed to the single label approach, we uh, tried doing multi-label classification, which uh, we basically do a binary classification using a sigmoid function uh, in a a multi and each voxel can have multiple labels. Basically, we use a single threshold of 0.5 on every label, um, but we make it exclusive. That means the labels are mutually exclusive. That means we exclude the, um, one of the labels. In this case, the gray matter is excluded, and we train the network on the CSF and white matter. The white matter and gray matter are iso-intense um, um, tissues here and we train the network and that one and complement it to get the gray matter segmented automatically. Um, and we choose the beta values in the F beta based on the class prevalence in the training data set. Um, this is how that would be calculated. So it actually lets you to automatically adjust the values. And this is the 3D FC dense net architecture. Um, I just quickly talk about it. It has um, it, it takes large patches from images. Um, all of these are 3D, and then we have dense blocks and of this kind and transition uh, down blocks, and four of more of these dense blocks, then you have the expanding path that, that is a reverse architecture, and you have the concat paths in between. Um, this FC, 3D FC dense net uh, uses large 3D patches, uh, for large effective receptive fields that I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, uses downsampling the first layer to limit the memory usage because we have three large 3D patches and we want to run on most computers. Includes five dense blocks. That makes it a 10 uh, total dense blocks. I will show how many parameters this will have compared to the others. Uh, and we talk about 3D large patches. Why is it useful? Um, it gives you high receptive field efficient use of memory, intrinsic data augmentation, you can, instead of the whole image, you can basically augment your patches, uh, flip and rotate them, and makes the network image size independent. If you choose a patch size that you know will fit all of the images that you would like to later try on this trained network, that would make it. Uh, but as, just as I talked about the effective receptive field, um, based on a paper that was published in NIPS in 2016, we know that in the borders of these patches, especially in image segmentation of this kind, you have, you're using less information, so the predictions are not very uh, reliable. Are not as reliable as what you would expect from a network, from, uh, from feeding that patch into the network and predicting in the middle of the image. For that reason, we take advantage of the patches and the augmentations that we have and fuse them using a BSP line, 3D BSP line uh, in, um, function, which basically resembles that Gaussian distribution. So in total, we have 32 predictions per patch that we fuse. Now to the results, uh, the ISEC challenge uh, has a blind test set of uh, 15, 13 images, and automatically they report to us the dice similarity coefficient, 
hot surface distance and average, uh, average surface distance. Um, I will show you the results, but uh, as a precaution, uh, we saw some differences between HD and ASD, whereas you would normally expect that two surface distances or two distance measures uh, should relatively show the same uh, um, um, performance. Um, however, we know that the HD, because of those max operations that it has and tries to match the points, is more sensitive to outliers. So uh, there are recommendations to avoid using HD and using its um, adapted versions in order to deal with that problem. Um, these are the results. So uh, while we used multi-class, multi-label segmentation instead of instead of all labels at the same time, and while we uh, used the F-beta loss functions, on the F1 score, we performed better than the other techniques. Uh, we actually, uh, these are the latest results on the challenge, and you see that according to the dice similarity metric and the ASD, um, in all of the three classes, uh, performance is better than the others. Um, and some ablation studies in order to see how that multi-label uh, versus single label, uh, what, how much of a difference is made. And the difference is actually significant in distinguishing the gray matter and white matter uh, tissue classes. So the top rows and these two rows should not be com uh, compared because uh, this is based on cross-validation on the training sets and we're not sure if those uh, techniques reported in that paper used uh, the same arrangement as we used in our cross-validation. But these are basically reported in order to look at the, uh, compare the networks and the relative performance that has been reported so far. So even in the cases, I, the average DICE and ASD metrics that I showed so re show relatively large difference. Even in cases that have very little difference in the validation set, you see uh, um, relatively big differences. So uh, I want to emphasize that even small, because these are big classes and we are very accurately segmenting these tissues, very small differences, especially for the cortex, make it a difference because you then uh, your topology correction algorithms and cortical thickness measurements, everything will change. In conclusion, through the design of a 3D densely connected network and training it with large 3D patches and patch prediction fusion strategy, using asymmetric similarity loss functions, which were uh, adjusted automatically, and exclusive multi-label training, we achieved the best performance in one of the uh, most challenging MRI segmentation tasks. Um, and um, you know, given the complexity of, the dis of distinguishing white matter and gray matter boundaries in this data, and the importance of cortical development and folding studies in, in this particular age, the improvements are considered crucial. Uh, just a few more notes on the asymmetric similarity loss function. Um, it gives a systematic way to deal with class imbalance, in particular for hardly distinguishable classes, but also it gives you the ability to uh, directly weigh the recall and precision definite, uh, differently. This is critical in applications where the false positive and false negatives are not, do not dis have the same exact importance. Uh, for example, in a clinical decision support system, you may aim for a higher recall value or true positive rate. In other applications, you can think the other way. Um, uh, one example is uh, lesion segmentation and detection, and I refer to Ryan's other paper, which was published uh, this year also. Um, I thank you um, and uh, um, welcome questions. So thanks, Ali. So the microphone is open for questions. Okay, so maybe I start. Since you're the senior author of this paper, maybe I can ask this. So if you, if you were a reviewer, what you, would you bring up as most critical point of the paper? The most critical point of the paper. Critical point of the paper. Um, you mean how I critic the paper? 
<laughs> Basically, I'm just a I'm asking about open problems. Oh, open problems in the field. Uh, all right. So I really want. I think that this work has uh, fun uh, introduces a fundamental approach, but um, I think that will be the future work. I think in generalizing this work to uh, applications with many classes. Uh, here we excluded one class and we had two more classes. Uh, um, but I, I see definite potential to apply it to a, a, the uh, application with many classes where you have data imbalance uh, in some of the labels. Uh, and for that, I really want to have a more systematic approach and a more fundamental um, um, explanation of why this will help. And, and that is uh, part of the future work, part of the ongoing work. Let's try to move on on the audience. Questions? There must be a question. Yeah. Okay, good. Can you comment on how you chose the beta values automatically? Sure. Better, better. So in here we just aim for um, dealing with data imbalance, uh, and so if if you look at that formulation for the if beta, that translates to to the false negatives and false positives. And if one of your classes is less represented, that means that may if you train the network. Uh, directly with the loss, with the F1 loss function, let's say you will have more false negatives on the uh, class which has uh, less prevalence. So then, uh, if that class is represented by N of Z for you, you can uh, just uh, take that um, coefficient here and its complement over there and assign it that way. You see a lambda here too, which is an extra recall hyperparameter. As I said, uh, as a side product of this, uh, you will have a chance to also adjust your recall and precision a little bit. That is something that Ryan uh, uh, did ad hoc. The rest of it was mostly what he predicted and thought that would work, and it worked. Um, I would say that this was not trivial, that this approach would beat the other approaches, especially those based on cross entropy or focal loss or uh, even dice loss function. Uh, especially when you use the dice itself for, for uh, evaluation. I wouldn't say that you should use dice for evaluating lesion segmentation, let's say. For that reason, we may just look at uh, true uh, lesion count or false lesion count, that, that type of thing, or F, F2 a score rather than F1, if you're looking at it as a whole. That is different from what you would do in case of just detection based on patches in an RCN type of framework. Okay, one, be, yeah, yeah. Or one more question. I see one, one over um, there. Hi. hi. I'm not sure I understood exactly this exclusive labeling. It means that whenever you choose a label, you cannot have another class in the same position. And if this is the case, do you think it would be a way, if it makes sense, that you have actually multiple layers in a way that you can maybe infer or predict kind of a partial volume? So which is the contribution of each class per Exact, I mean, exactly, yeah. yes, that, that is a um, great idea. That is actually goes back to what I mentioned about the more fundamental explanation and development of these ideas. I see a lot of potential and um, um, applications for this. Partial volume in correction could be one of those. As soon as you detect where you are in that boundary, uh, you can uh, work on it and find ways to, yes. Thank That's you. a great idea. Okay, let's, sorry, <laughs> let's thank the speaker again.